Buenos días. Buenos días. Hoy es miércoles. It's Wednesday. And I'm happy to be able to talk to you from God's Word today. So I want to thank God because these Christian men that I'm working with here help me. My wife's sitting in the studio today with me. So I have a lot to thank God for. How about you? Oh, you're counting your problems? Mm. So I have a word for you. Count your many blessings. Name them one by one. Count your many blessings. See what God has done. Count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your many blessings. See what God has done. Count your blessings. Get the scowl and that heavy spirit off of you. That God doesn't want you to. What kind of advertisement are we going to be for Jesus walking around all sour or angry and shaking our fist at the world? No. The joy of the Lord is our strength. Chapter 12 tells about the fact that about this time the King Herod arrested some who belonged to the church intending to persecute them. He had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. And when he saw that this met with the approval among the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened to the festival of, uh, during the festival of unleavened bread. After arresting him, he put him in prison, handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. Four times four equals 16. I remember that. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but the church was earnestly praying to God for him. Then, as we're going to see, I'm going to paraphrase it, Peter is delivered out of that prison and certain death. Then the end of the chapter, I hope you read it. And by the way, for tomorrow, read chapter 13, one of my favorite chapters in Acts. Um, Herod uh, boasts in such a way that God uh, uh, has his life end. You'll read about that. And then Barnabas and Saul, after they come with the offering to Jerusalem, they are sent back uh, to Antioch, where, uh, with along with John Mark, who had a relationship with Peter, was close to Peter, maybe a relative. So that's the summary of the chapter. So what's interesting here, though, is the power of prayer and how the early church reacted. And you just compare it with your church experience, wherever you are, Australia, Mississippi, England, Switzerland, Poland, Africa. The Bible gives us the model, not some pastor today or church growth expert. James, the brother of John, is beheaded. When Herod, who was a wicked, wicked king, when he saw that that pleased the Jews, oh, what a nice mentality. He says, well, let me, let me double my fun here. And he arrests Peter and has him four at a time, a six hours uh, tour of duty, bound by chains, filthy dungeon, no light. And he's going to bring him up for a mock trial, and it's over for Peter, too. And the church in Jerusalem is going to lose their senior pastor, probably. He was certainly a leader. So he was locked up, but the church shut down everything, and just pray. Some of the other translations have, and a steady stream of prayer went up from the church. How do you think they were praying? What do you think they were praying about? God, save Peter. No, he can't be saved. But no, we have no financial uh, uh, considerations. We can't buy off anyone. We don't have money, the early church. We have no political connections. Someone to spring them loose. We can't go to the Supreme Court and plead our case on a legal basis. No, they had nothing. Oh, no, no, don't say that. They had God. And a steady steam of prayer. What did they do? I don't know. It doesn't say. 
but can we imagine that just around the clock, as much as they could be free, they just prayed for Peter together, corporate. You know, there's something about corporate prayer. When my daughter was away from God all those years ago, two and a half year nightmare, my wife and I went through, oh, on a Tuesday night, the church prayed, mm, mm, mm. became like a labor room. You ever pray like that? If you open your heart to the Holy Spirit and if you're burdened about something and you really care, you think they were just mentally praying, uh, basically, Lord, it's good to be here today. Peter's in a jam. Maybe, possibly, could you help him? Mm, I don't think so. You ever see the Jews, the way they pray in the wailing wall? A lot of those, those were former Jews who are praying now in the Holy Spirit. I'm not for commotion. I'm not for emotionalism, but my goodness. Some prayer is so mental and so dead and absent of the Holy Spirit that it's just we're doing it because we're supposed to do it. But when you seek me with all your heart, God says, you'll find me. So they prayed. So what did God do in answer to their prayer? Peter's asleep. So he's he not doing anything and he's not praying. But notice the power of intercession. They're praying constantly and just at the right moment, a light shines in the cell. A light from heaven. Something from heaven comes when you pray. How? I'm not in prison. No, don't get the specifics to bog you down. When we pray, when I've prayed, when my wife has prayed, when we call on God, something is sent from heaven. Help, grace, wisdom, an answer, a person, money, $6 million in 10 minutes. I've had all those things happen to me when we pray. Something sent from heaven. That's what we need in our churches. Do we need more PowerPoint? Do we need more fog machines? No, I think we need something from heaven. Can't be manufactured by men. Another thing is, his, he got woken up. Angel tapped him, woke him up. When people pray, God wakes up other people, not from physical sleep, but from spiritual sleep. That's how my daughter came back to God. God gave her a dream in the middle of the night. That woke her up. She saw what she, where she was heading. That came in answer to prayer. God wakes people up. Are you love someone and they're sleeping? They're living in sin, practicing sin, don't want to hear about it. They're sleeping. They're, they're dense right now. But God can wake them up. How? However, that's, God does it different. Lastly, the chains fell off. Aren't you happy that when we pray, chains that are holding people back can be broken? You know, I'm here in Florida, and there's a niece of my wife's that's here. She's a real Christian. And she wasn't serving the Lord, but she made a visit to New York, sat in one of our meetings, had heard about Jesus, wasn't serving Jesus, had Christian mother, uh, but just rebellious. And I remember preaching, and she, I looked down, and there she was crying like a baby at the altar. And, you know, you're hopeful. Praise God. And guess what? Her life was changed. The chains fell off, whatever she was into, whatever holding her back. But God breaks chains. You can't break them. God breaks chains. You don't need 72 hours of counseling from a therapist or a pastor. The touch of God, he touched me. Oh, he touched me. You don't believe in that anymore? I feel bad for you. Because that's what the Bible says, and God doesn't change. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the angel let him out. Peter thought everybody else fell asleep, the guards. And Peter goes out, and they're walking by all the stations to get to freedom. And there's one last door. And instead of knocking it down, it opens by itself. Last thought, when we pray, God opens doors. You don't have to sweat it, push it, worry about it. 
God will open doors for us as we put our trust in him and pray. God bless you.